Hello everyone. Welcome to today's 10 minute CME on individualizing insulin therapy for type 2 diabetes. I am Professor Rakesh Sahai from Hyderabad speaking to you about this aspect of insulin use in patients with type 2 diabetes. We all know that maintaining euglycemia is very important in all our patients with type 2 diabetes. This helps in not only reducing the microvascular complications the macrovascular disease and also brings down the total diabetes related costs. And for achieving this euglycemia, insulin is a very important option because it provides the maximum reduction in HVUNC as compared to any of the other available therapies. When you look at the desired targets of HVUNC, we across the globe, different organizations have recommended a target HVUNC of less than 7%. For most of our patients some of our patients who have a, ver a variety of uh, comorbidities may be allowed to have a higher target of less than 7.5 or less than 8 percent but across the board we look at a target of less than seven percent the american diabetes association has recommended a fasting glucose target of less than 130 and a post prandial glucose target of less than 180 while the RSSDI and the ESI together have come out with a consensus guideline on which, in which also they recommend a fasting target of less than 110 and a post prandial glucose target of less than 180. Now, who are these people who require insulin in patients amongst our patients with type 2 diabetes? Any of our patients with type 2 diabetes who's on at least three oral agents and not able to mint, achieve this glycemic target requires insulin and insulin needs to be initiated. Once initiated, it has to be titrated so as to achieve optimal control. And in some patients who fail to maintain optimal control, intensification of insulin therapy is also required. So there are other people who require insulin even at diagnosis. That is, they have not been started on oral anti-diabetic medications, but they are directly requiring insulin. And these are people who are symptomatic with severe hyperglycemic symptoms have evidence of organ dysfunction or they have some degree of metabolic decompensation and significant or ongoing catabolism and these when when these individuals have hvnc of more than 10 percent or if the glucose levels are more than 300 milligram per dl then these are individuals who require insulin therapy even at onset of diabetes then there are women with diabetes who are planning pregnancy or those who develop diabetes during pregnancy that is called as gestational diabetes these are all the situations where insulin may be required even when three oral agents have not been used so what do we plan to achieve when we are trying to give insulin in a patient we are trying to mimic the physiological insulin secretion as you can see here insulin secretion in a normal individual in physiological state would consist of a Continuous insulin being secreted throughout the day, which is called as a basal insulin secretion. And in addition to that, we have the prandial insulin release, which occurs with the, with, with the breakfast, with lunch, with dinner. And then the, the levels of insulin come back to the basal levels in between the meats. So this is what we are trying to imitate or mimic when we are trying to give insulin exogenously. So when we use insulin in any, any patient with type 2 diabetes, what do we want? We want a complete glycemic control, which was not being provided by the OADs. And this helps in preventing the long-term risk of complications. We want no side effects like hypoglycemia or weight gain. And we want it to be available in a convenient and minimal uh, injection burden uh, formulation. So if you look at the various incidents, we see that from the amongst the different insulins, the analog insulins provide many of these benefits without, without causing a significant burden to the patient in terms of the injection technique and all the other aspects. When we look at the options that we have for initiating insulin, we can either do it with a single dose of basal insulin therapy. This requires a single injection. It's simple and easy for uh, uh, many of the people. It is particularly useful in people who have a very high fasting glucose levels and a, not a very significant rise in postprandial glucose levels. Then we have the option of using 
basal bolus therapy, which is the gold standard therapy, which mimics normal physiology very nicely. And it has, it provides very good control in terms of uh, providing for the basal uh, supplementation and also the perennial insulin supplementation. But the downside of this is that it requires multiple injections and it may be difficult in some situations to teach the patient to take injections and do carbohydrate counting and it can lead to a significant weight gain. Then we have the convenient option in between these two that is a premix formulation where both the rapid acting component and the basal insulin are available in the same syringe and this can be in the form of premixed formulation or a co-formulation. The advantage of this type of insulin is that it can have it can you can go with minimum lesser number of picks at the same time you provide for both the uh, replacements of control of both the fasting and the post glucose control there can be some issues with hypoglycemia in some patients when the dose of insulin needs to be adjusted and therefore this becomes a problem in some situations now, there can be another way of looking at the different options that we have. We can look at people who are elderly or those who are in young children as compared to pregnancy. So if you look at children, most of them require a full insulin supplementation that is providing for basal supplementation and also the parental insulin supplementation. Then we have in the many of the adults who require insulin, we can go with premixed or, or co-formulations. Uh, co while during pregnancy, the ma major requirement is for brandy insulin supplementation and some of uh, some individuals, some women, we may require basal bolus therapy also in this uh, scenario. Now, let us look at what should be done to the OADs when we start insulin in a patient with type 2 diabetes. When, you, when a patient is on metformin alone, we can continue metformin while the insulin is starting because metformin predominantly works by increasing the insulin sensitivity well when you're looking at the SUs or the sulfonylureas once we initiate in, in basal insulin then the SUs can be continued because they are required for providing the prandial glucose control while a patient who is started on a premixed insulin or when a patient is started on basal bolus insulin then the SUs can be stopped in some situations we may continue the SUs to reduce the requirement for insulin. But we should be wary of the fact that in such situations, there can be a higher risk of hypoglycemia. What about the glitazones? If any of our patients are on glitazones and they started on insulin, then we reduce the dose of glitazones by 50%, but continue the glitazones. We discontinue them if they develop signs of cardiac failure. What about alpha glucosidase inhibitors, which are predominantly used for control of postprandial hypoglycemia. In patients who require insulin and who are on alpha glucosidase inhibitors, we can continue the alpha glucosidase inhibitors because they provide additional benefit of better postprandial glucose control along with the insulin. For those who are on DPP-4 inhibitors, we can continue to use the DPP before inhibitors along with the insulin. And in for those who are on SGLT2 inhibitors, what we need to look at is they also can be used, continue to be used along with the insulin, and they also help in reducing the dose of insulin that are required to achieve, achieve optimal glycemic control. In patients who are not on SGLT2 inhibitors and who are started on insulin, they can additionally be considered if the patient has evidence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or renal disease because in such situations SGLD2 inhibitors provide benefit even beyond the glycemic benefit that they provide. Once we decide to initiate insulin in a patient with type 2 diabetes, we generally initiate with a dose of 0.2 to 0.3 units per kg body weight. And once we look at the response that we see in these patients based on the self-monitoring of blood glucose, we can then add up titrate the doses or down titrate depending on the response that we that is seen for the basal or premixed or co-formulation insulins we generally look at the pre-breakfast and the pre-dinner values if the value is less than one less than 80 then we need to reduce it by two units 
or if it is more than 130 then we add it add two more units and as you can see in this table we can clearly look at see the way in which this up titration or down titration can be done in and this is done generally every two to three days for both bolus insulins we would prefer to use the post branded plasma glucose a two hour post branded plasma glucose as the basis for either up titrating or down titrating the insulin doses again in in gradients of two four or six units as seen in this table and this would help us in reaching the glycemic goal within a few days so the titration every every up titration or down titration can be done in two to three days and in a couple of weeks the patient can achieve the maximum control